When I was uh, seven years old, my uh, grandfather and one of my uncles died, leaving my grandmother and my aunt as widows. It came very unexpectedly. Neither of the deaths were expected. As a matter of fact, my grandfather was in for routine surgery in the hospital at the very time my mother was giving birth to my youngest brother. My uncle had gone over to complete the work on the house that he and my aunt were about to move into. And he didn't return back for dinner and they went to find him dead in the basement. And only imagine the grief and tragedy. As a seven-year-old, I was oblivious to nearly all of it. I knew is that I got sent over to a friend's house to stay with them for a few days, and I understood a little of it. But from that point in time, those two widows, my grandmother and my aunt, became even more inseparably attached to our family. They, they were just part of who we were and part of what we did. Every Sunday, they were at the table. Throughout the week, they would be back home. They uh, lived together in uh, my grandparents' home. But Baba and Auntie Nancy, as we knew them, they were just part of all that we did. And we were so grateful for them. My grandmother was a quiet little woman whose heart was still in some ways in England, and that was her home that she talked about. And uh, I must confess, three boys treated her somewhat mercilessly in our years. We didn't, but we loved her, and she loved us, and they gave back into our life so many things. I can still walk through in my memory her house, that strange sawdust furnace down in the basement with the uh, icebox on the back porch, that special long wave, short wave radio that was in the front room, the back area, the wonderful library my grandfather had up in the second area. When we go up, many of those books that landed in my father's house and his grandson read all kinds of those wonderful books and enriched my life in so many ways. I remember when I took her funeral, my sense of wishing I'd sat more and talked instead of been out the door going and playing sports and learned and listened. When the Bible speaks about the church, we've had it in the book of 1 Timothy. It is a church of the living God, a congregation of the living God, a household of God, pillar and buttress of the truth. It isn't just a place we attend. A local congregation is meant to be a household, a family of God living and connected together. Jesus said, new commandment, I give to you that you love one another as I've loved you. This is the way all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. And this place is a place in which we're called to live that out. And sometimes that has very practical significance, very specific ways in which it's to be worked out. And the passage we're going to look at this morning is one of those interesting places. I can virtually guarantee you that unless you've been listening to a person speaking on 1 Timothy all the way through the book, you have never heard a sermon on the passage I'm going to be looking at this morning. Uh, I've never heard one. I've never preached one. It is one of those sort of unusual passages, and we'll see it as we go through it. Well, let's get to it. Let's read it first. And it's a longer passage than we'd normally read. And it twists and turns a bit, but we'll unwind it as we go through. So 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a brother, a father, sorry. Younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, 
for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She was truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God and continues in supplication and prayer night and day. She who's self-indulgent is dead even when she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied his faith, and he's worse than an unbeliever. Let a widow be enrolled if she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband and having a reputation for good works. If she's brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted and has devoted herself to every good work, but refused to enroll, I think that's way too strong. Don't enroll younger widows. Excuse me, for when their passions draw them away from Christ, they desire to marry and so incur judgment. Condemnation implies from God. I think in this case it's more condemnation or criticism for having abandoned their former pledge. The passage, although we'll come back to it, the word is best translated pledge and we'll get to it later. Not their faith, this isn't apostasy they're talking about, but departure from a particular pledge. Besides that, they may learn to be idlers, going about from house to house, and not only idlers, but gossips and busybodies saying what they should not. So, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander, for some have already strayed after Satan. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Well, you now understand why it's <laughs> unusual. There's all, what is going on precisely here? Well, let me just back up a little bit. In chapter four from verse six to verse 16, Paul has focused on very directly on Timothy. Timothy, be a good servant of Christ Jesus. And he's talked about his character. He's talked about his priorities. He's talked about the things that ought to matter most. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. That's the way you'll save yourself and you'll save others. Having said that, he's now concerned to talk about, now listen, there's some issues we need to talk about in the local church, and there's going to be a series of groups. First of all, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5, sort of four different sections of the church. Then widows, then elders, the elders of the church, then slaves and their relationship to their masters. So he begins here in verses 1 and 2 by the general statement about the household, about the family and his relationship to them. And he begins with that statement in verse 5, do not rebuke an older man. Now let me look at that word rebuke with you for just a moment because that's a little misleading, that translation. The word is a very rare one and it literally means to strike blows. It's better translated, do not rebuke sharply an older person. Because later, when we get to verse 20 in this chapter, Paul will tell Timothy he is to rebuke somebody who sinned. And in chapter 2 of Titus, chapter 2, verse 15, he says, appeal, exhort, rebuke. So there is a place for rebuke. But Paul's concern is how, Timothy, you're going to treat an older believer. Remember, Timothy was told in the previous section, don't let anyone despise your youth. He's in his early 30s. And he's talking about senior saints in that particular way. And behind it stands a basic biblical principle in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. 
and you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord. And it was built into the system of Israel, just as it like is in so many other cultures, less in our culture today than perhaps in almost any time in history, honor those who are older, show them respect, recognize them for who they are and what they have done before you. And I think in my life, in ministry and so forth, uh, all kinds of names come of older people. In a particular way, that's been true of us in the last way because we spent 17 years in Calgary and it seems now that almost every second week we get a phone call from one of the people we love up there telling us of another brother or sister who meant so much. They encouraged us, they supported us, they prayed for us, they ministered to us, they showered care upon us, and they've been called to heaven. And it's almost as if we go back, the only place we could visit was by going to the graveyard. And so, so much of my life has been under the blessing as even as a young man in my earlier years before uh, university and that by older believers who ministered into my life. But I've also ministered to others in that church and their name doesn't always bring up that memory. Uh, they were cranky or they were stubborn or they were determined. I know only very few older people have that attitude, but <laughs> things would come and they were anchored in the way things used to be and the way we've always done things. And this is the tradition and sometimes they needed to be challenged and some of them would act totally improperly, uh, really criticizing younger Christians who in their sincerity may have made a mistake, but they didn't deserve the response. And so Paul is saying, you're going to have to deal with people who are older. Now I be one. And the issue is rebuke them, but show grace, exhort them, encourage them as a father. Show the respect, show the concern. Children sometimes know what it is to have to rebuke their parent at a particular time, but you don't do it like you do it to someone else. Well, sadly, we often do. But Paul is saying to Timothy, this young man, a relatively young man, show care and consideration as to fathers. Treat them with the respect that they deserve. And even though you may not fully understand them, they bring some things into your life that you will never have in any other way. And then he says, and treat the younger men like brothers. You may be the leader in the church, but you're not the master of them. You're a brother of them. And treat them like brothers. Now, one of the things that's obvious, you can say things to your brother in a way you ought not say it to your father. And you can be fairly direct, but he's saying, they're your brothers in Christ, and don't forget that in the way you treat them. And the older women, God bless the older women in my life. And I think of so many of those I've already mentioned in terms of those who came around Elizabeth and, and nurtured her and, and encouraged her and brought out gifts in her and abilities in her and blessed her in a multitude of ways and in that way affected and impacted my life in so many different ways. And Paul says, Treat them like mothers. Older women are in some way the emotional center of a church and, and the heart of what goes on. And Timothy says, treat them like a mother. Love them, respect them, honor them, and care for them. And then, the younger women. Treat them like sisters. And we all know at this point what it means as a challenge for a man who's in ministry who's a single man like Timothy was to relate to women who often were attracted to him and he was attracted to them, but there are boundaries you cannot pass. Treat them like sisters. 
Treat them like people who deserve your respect and your care of affection, but don't cross that boundary. And we all know the sad story of so many who haven't treated women in the church like sisters and have dishonored the Lord as well as dishonoring those young women. So it's very practical teaching about what Timothy is to do as he lives his life. But Paul's big concern is what he comes to in verse 3. And it takes us into a different world than we know. And it's worth kind of thinking here a little bit about widows and where they fit. We live in a world that has social security. It has retirement plans. It has pensions. It has investment opportunities. That wasn't the world of the first century. Women, when they were widowed, had no claim on their husband's inheritance. That went to their son or someone else. Of course, most of the women in the first century, when their husband died, they had no inheritance. Most of them were poor, among the poorest of the poor. And we can think of countries around the world where the vast majority of our believing brothers and sisters, when a man dies and leaves his wife, they are left defenseless. And they are the prey for scammers. And they are a prey for abusers. And that's true enough in our own society. Uh, we get the phone calls. We get the other kind of manipulative kind of advices. And it's aimed nearly at the older and often those who don't have someone around them to give them counsel. And so over and over in the Old Testament, there's a concern for widows. They're mentioned over 100 times in the Old Testament as a special concern from God. Listen, for example, to Psalm 64, verses 4 to 6. His name is Yahweh. Exult before him, father of the fatherless, and protector, defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. God settles the solitary in a home. Father of the fatherless, and defender of of widows. Exodus 22 reads, you shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn out and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children's fatherless. Or hear Deuteronomy 27, verse 19. Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Jesus took up the same concern. Because widows mattered to him. His mother was one. He didn't walk past in the village of Nain when he saw a widow who lost her only son in utter despair, stopped and raised a widow, a widow's son, and presented her alive back to her, his mother. He stops and watches a woman throw in her two mites a widow and say she's done more than all these others. He looks at the Jewish leaders, and he says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' homes and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And we know that in the beginning of the early church, when God brought into being this new thing, and we read about caring for one another and having all things in common financially, Acts chapter 6, one of the things that happened first is that there needed to be care not only for widows, but especially for those 
widows who were diaspora Greek-speaking widows because they were being overlooked. And James, in his famous statement in the book of James, says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the devil. Widows have a special place in the heart of God. Therefore, Paul is saying, widows need to have a special place in the life of the church. And there's three different groups, maybe four we could talk about in this passage. So some of it gets a little bit difficult to unravel, but let me just walk with you through it. First of all, in verse three, we meet this rather unusual expression, honor widows who are truly widows, or as other translations, honor widows who are widows indeed. Well, every widow was a widow. In other words, her husband has died or her husband has abandoned her. And yet he's talking about something specific here. And you'll notice it says it more clearly when we get to verse um, <laughs> verse nine, I'm sorry. That's not the verse that my mind is after. Verse five, she who was truly a widow left all alone. A widow indeed is someone not only without a husband, but without any family to care for her, to support her, to encourage her, whether children or relatives in other ways, she is a widow on her own. Now the statement begins, honor, a widow who is really a widow. The word honor has a double meaning. It's a play on words because the word comes from a word that means to pay. So on one level, it looks at respect and concern. But in this context, it also looks at honorarium as we use the word. So honor, honorarium. They are to be respected but they are also to be provided for. Now, there's some special qualifications. So notice what he says, and this doesn't go sort of in order. We're piecing it together from different places. So notice verse five. She who was truly a widow left all alone. She set her hope on God. She is a believing widow. She's someone who's trusting Christ. So the issue here is widows who are followers of Christ and who are living godly lives. It continues in supplications and prayers day and night. Then in verse nine, we read, let a widow be enrolled. Now what appears to have happened, and we'll come back to this a little bit later again, is that the church in Ephesus had taken on the care of widows. And they'd had a role that had been set up of those who should be there. And with that role came a pledge. And that pledge is they would remain unmarried and they would give their time to serving and ministering in the church in a particular way. And so, Paul now is coming back and he's looking at the fact that that is in place, but because of the way it's defined, problems have arisen and he's trying to help put some framework around this. So he says, the widows you're enrolling should be 60 or above. Now again, we need to think back here. It's estimated that at best, 5% of people in the first century reached the age of 60. This isn't talking about our age of 60. This is talking about someone who's much older than that, if you, if you can think of that in terms of their abilities and the health and the, and the recognition of it. And that was the age, commonly, it's interesting that Social Security in the United States began with 60, I think, and has been raised up to different levels going along as, 
Older people live longer and are healthier, but here's a time when that was, where you were no longer able to work. You were no longer able to support yourself. So it's those kind of women who are to be enrolled and cared for by the church. Now, let me say one other thing that's significant here. This is talking about regular care. It's not talking about there's an emergency need. Don't help them because they're not old enough. It, it's talking about what the, if I can put it this way, the program of caring was, not talking about what ongoing issues were. And the issue is that they are to have not only a Christian uh, profession of faith, but notice how they're described. They've been a husband of one, the wife of one husband, which means faithful in their marriage vows, having a reputation for good works, having brought up children, having shown hospitality, having washed, that is, served the saints, washing their feet is a symbol of that, having cared for the afflicted and devoted herself to every good work. Those are the people, Paul says, you need to make the prior responsibility for the church. But there's another group, and they are widows as well. But they are widows who have a believing family network to support them and encourage them. And three times Paul comes back just to pound this idea home. Verse 4, if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them, that is the children and grandchildren, first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make return to their parents. This is pleasing in the sight of God. It is a responsibility to care for them. And then a little bit later, he will command that same thing. Verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he is denied the faith and he's worse than an unbeliever. Worse, why? Because even believers care for their own. Even believers care for their family. And you have dishonored the Lord as well as dishonored the widow. And then he returns again. And this one raises a few questions. But verse 16, if any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. First two were aimed at the male head of the family, but this may be a woman who has enough wealth to care for some widows, even though she's not related, and she says, care for them. So he's saying, if you are a believing family, it is dishonoring to God if you are not caring for them. And he's not simply talking about financial support. He's talking about personal support and spiritual support. When our daughter was uh, ill after her operation, she had to go into a care home for a few weeks. She was a, a great exception to all the rest. Most of them were seniors. And the number of them, and I didn't go around doing it, but the number of them that had not seen a living relative in months and in some cases years was shameful. They'd been parked there, and they'd been abandoned. Not financially, someone was still paying to support them. And so that puts a heavy responsibility on us to think, I have a responsibility to those who have nurtured me and built into my life, whether it's grandparent or parent, to be responding back to the glory of God. And now we come to the younger widows. And Paul gets very practical here and he says, listen, there's younger widows who signed the pledge and it seemed like a good thing to do. And then they had still normal sexual desires. They met somebody and they were in a position, am I going to keep my pledge? Or am I going to turn my back on that and go in another way? And he said some of them had just 
turned their back. And, and because they made an unwise pledge, they have also in some ways turned away from the Lord and spiritual things and moved off in that different direction. He said, my counsel is that you tell the younger widows to marry. No, don't put them in that position where they're going to be caught between who they are as women with legitimate needs and who they are because they've made this pledge. Encourage them to live a godly life and a wholesome life. Verse 14, I would have younger widows marry, bear children, manage their households, give the adversary no occasion for slander. And that's where he leaves it. Now I want you to notice with me something I think is important. Paul's advice here is both principled and pragmatic. The pragmatic, pragmatic part is we can't care for every kind of widow, but we do have a responsibility for Christian widows. But Christian families have a responsibility to care for their widows. So we're responsible to take responsibility for those who don't have those resources and those background and support them in that way. And we have to deal with that. The age 60 was arbitrary. He'd argue for 59 or 61. I don't think he's wanting to set those kind of standards and we recognize the basis of this. And he's commanding it for Timothy. He's not saying churches everywhere have to imitate those kind of things. But the principle is clear, is that God's people have to care for God's people who are otherwise vulnerable and exposed. I'm grateful that in my personal history, the church at which I grew up had a burden that caused them to begin a campaign to raise a lot of money and to build a senior's home to care for widows in a practical way. Sadly, just like in the United States, the government has bought more and more restrictions that make that very difficult. And so it's become increasingly a challenge. But my grandmother ended her life in that home that had been provided because of the sacrificial giving of a lot of believers. We as a church, may find ourselves, you know, this specific thing doesn't require, it doesn't apply to us. We don't have somebody specifically in that way, but in the larger sense, we have to say it is our, God, our calling under God to be a family, to care for God's people in the way God desires, in a way that honors him. So we can't come to this passage with all of its unusualness to us and even some of the details that I can't quite unravel of exactly how that was supposed to work comes out and says, first of all in verses one and two, treat your fellow believers in Christ. If they're older like spiritual fathers and mothers, if they're the same age as spiritual brothers and sisters and live in a way that honors God. If you've got Christian family, Christian older people who are widowed or in need. You have a responsibility to God to care for them. We live in a time where older people live with an obsession. I don't want to be a burden on any of my children. Paul is saying here, you're not really a burden, you're a blessing. And you need to be honored as a blessing by those who are responsible to care. And as a church, it comes to us and say, where do we live this out? Maybe in other ways, because this is a sample and there may be other ways. And we say, you know what? We need to be what the house of God is called to be and recognize what it means that we're part of the new family that God has brought together. 
and live and show in practical ways, both personally and corporately, what it means that we are the people of God as we sang. And God's love has called us not only to enjoy eternity together, but live together for his glory as we live here and now. And it's all about Christ. The only reason we carry these things is he's done something in our hearts so profound that we see everything in life differently. We see older people, younger people, men, women, through a new lens of who they are because of who we are in Christ. And it all comes back to the cross. It all comes back to the reality that as we take this table and come to this table, I've always disliked contexts where you walk up and everybody gets a file uh, in a file and you take it one at a time and then you go and sit down. Is that unchristian? No. But does it miss a great truth that even as the early disciples sat and passed that cup around the one table together at the same time, it became a family time, not simply a personal time before the Lord. During COVID, we couldn't do that. We did it at home individually, but there was something enormously missing in that. It's that we now are around the table to take these symbols the Lord has given to say, we're your family and these are my brothers and sisters. So we take the cup, we take the bread and give thanks if we've trusted Christ. But if you've not trusted him, then the invitation is join the family. Bow your knee. Know that Christ died for you. Admit your sin and trust him as Lord and Savior. Father, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the power of the cross that makes enemies friends, that makes strangers brothers and sisters, fathers and mothers. So as we take these symbols this morning, we pray that we would honor you in taking them with our heart full of gratitude for the body of our Savior given for us, for the blood of the Lamb of God shed for us. Thank you for the power of the cross.